Hello, the story I have for you today is called A Band of Angels. It's inspired by, or means it's based on, a real life story about what's called the Fisk Jubilee Singers. It's by Deborah Hopkinson and it is illustrated by Raul Colon. And in the beginning of the story, you will see little pictures of people. It says the Jubilee Singers. And I will show those to you when I'm finished reading the book so you can know who they are. My Aunt Beth calls herself a treasure keeper. Her treasures are the stories about our family that she keeps in her heart. Of all these treasures, my favorite is the story of my great-great-grandmother, Ella. Do you have a special person in your family that tells you stories about the people in your family way far back? Grandma Ella was born into slavery, Aunt Beth always begins, but no one could chain her voice. Everyone said singing was a part of that child the way swallows are a part of the sky. As Aunt Beth talks, I close my eyes and try to imagine a girl long ago who loved to sing. I see her slipping into an empty church to practice on the old piano there. She thinks she is alone, but everyone walking by outside stops to hear her songs. So this is her imagining. So several hundred years ago in America, black people were enslaved by white people. And that means that they had to work very hard. They were not paid for their work. They couldn't choose what they had to do. They couldn't stay with their families. It was very bad. And so Ella was born into that. You couldn't, you didn't choose it. If you were born to somebody who was enslaved, that meant you were enslaved too. When Ella was 14, the Civil War and slavery ended at last, Aunt Beth explains. It was now the law that everyone, black or white, could get an education, but most schools and colleges were still only for white people. So when Ella heard about a new school for freed slaves in Nashville called Fisk School, she wanted with all her heart to go but she had no money to pay for it. Ella began to keep a jar for coins, filling it with money she'd earn any way she could. At weddings, Ella played the piano. She scrubbed clothes for a few pennies. Yet when the time came for school to start, she'd saved only six dollars. She packed her things in a trunk anyway and hired a wagon to take her to Nashville. As Aunt Beth tells the story about the journey, I see Ella perched high on that wagon seat eager for her first sight of Fisk School. When its shabby wooden buildings appear before her, she's not even disappointed. She's too excited to be going to school at last. So remember, so when the Civil War was over, that was a war that people in America fought about ending slavery. When it was over, they freed the slaves, but because those people who were in slavery did not have any money, they were very, very poor, and Ella didn't have any money from all the work she'd been doing before. So she started trying to save up money to go to school. And a lot of schools still would not let black people in, so she had to go to a special school that was just for black people. The first person Ella met at school was Professor George White, the music teacher, Aunt Bet said. She held out her money to him. I'm afraid this is only enough for three weeks, he told her. Ella must have felt discouraged standing before him with her little trunk, no bigger than a pie box, at her feet. But she didn't let that stop her. She just kept working to make those three weeks longer and longer. She washed dishes and waited on tables in the dining hall. She gave music lessons to children in town. And late at night, when everyone else was asleep, she sat up with a basket of mending. So she only has enough to go to school for three weeks. That's not enough. But she keeps thinking of ways to earn money because she loves school. I imagine Ella head bent over her work, needle flashing in the lamplight. A book is propped up on the table so she can study while she sews. And I know my great-great-grandmother had a love of learning inside her that glowed like a warm, bright flame. So look, she's studying and sewing. No matter how tired Ella was, she was always ready for music, Aunt Beth lets me know. The first time Professor White heard her singing, he invited her to join the school chorus. It wasn't long before she was playing the piano for the singers, too. Soon they had learned many classical pieces and popular songs of the day that white people sang. 
But the chorus sang the old slave songs too, didn't they, I ask? Shh, wait, Aunt Beth laughs. We haven't gotten to that part yet. So there's a chorus, a group of singers, and Ella's playing the piano. And they're learning what's called classical music, which is music from way, 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 hundreds and hundreds of years back. And they're learning the songs that the white people sing. And the little girl says, are they learning the slave songs? When people were in slavery, they often had special, beautiful songs that they would sing to help them feel better, that they would pass down. But we're not at that part yet. It was rainy that fall and the roofs leaked. The students' rooms were cold and damp. And one night after practice, Professor White had bad news for the singers. Our buildings won't last much longer, he said, and there's no money to fix them or build new ones. Unless something can be done, Fisk School will close. All Ella's friends were working hard to pay for school. Jenny Jackson took in washing. Benjamin Holmes was a tailor. Green Evans did odd jobs like painting and hauling gravel. If Fisk closed, they'd have no place to study. Their dreams for a brighter day would be lost. So now, most of these people in the school were born into slavery. And when you were born into slavery, you were not allowed to learn how to read and write or go to school. That was the law. So they're so excited to be able to go now and to learn. And they're worried that Fisk will have to close. Sometimes songs arise from happiness, sometimes from sorrow. When Ella heard the news about her school, her heart was so heavy, she just had to sing. She remembered a song she'd learned as a little girl, a song from her slavery days. By then, few people were singing the old songs and some were even being forgotten. They reminded people of their pain and of the hard days of slavery, but they were about hope too. So Ella began to sing. Sing for me now, Aunt Beth, I whisper. Aunt Beth holds me close and we sing together. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. That's a special song that people would sing back in the days of slavery. Now comes the part of the story I like best. What happened next, I ask, though I already know. Did the school close? The school leaders were ready to give up, but not Professor White. He thought of a way that he and the singers could help. Our chorus is as good as any in the country, he declared, and I believe people will buy tickets to hear us sing. If we give concerts up north, we can use the money to build a new school. Are you willing to try? Ella spoke for all of them. Of course we will. I think about how frightened Grandma Ella must have been before that long journey. She'd never ridden on a train or been up north before. How she must have shivered in her thin coat and cloth shoes. But I also think Ella made herself be brave. The whole school was counting on them. So they're in the South, in Tennessee, they're going to go up North and do concerts and try and raise money. What do you think will happen? Will people want to see them? As they traveled from town to town, those nine young singers faced many hardships, Aunt Beth tells me. Often they were turned away from restaurants because their skin was black. One stormy evening, no hotel would take them in. They trudged through the rain until at last someone let them stay in a leaky old shed. Ella slept wrapped in her coat, trying to keep warm. So even though the days of slavery were over, it was people still didn't like black people in some places. That says no vacancy, that means no room at that hotel. There might have been room and the owner just didn't want to let them stay. And that was still allowed. You could still do that. It wasn't right, though. The chorus sang only the popular white songs they thought audiences wanted, like Annie Laurie and Home Sweet Home. Night after night, Ella would put on her one nice dress, her face hopeful. But night after night, she would look out to see just a few people in a dark, empty hall. Aunt Beth's words make me feel like crying. And then I wonder if maybe Grandma Ella cried too when no one was looking. 
they traveled so far and worked so hard and only a few people came to come see them. Professor White didn't want to go back, but he didn't know what else to do. One evening before they went on stage, he spoke to the singers. We did the best we could, but I'm afraid we must go home tomorrow, he said. We haven't been able to raise even $500, and our school needs $5,000. The singers stood together without speaking. Then Ella turned slowly and walked across the lighted stage to take her place at the piano. The others filed in. Ella rested her fingers on the keys, wondering if this was the last time they'd ever sing together. Everyone in the hall was watching, waiting for her to begin. She took a deep breath, and somehow at that moment she found the courage to reach inside her heart and bring forth her own song. In the silent hall, her voice rang out clear and strong. No more auction block for me. No more, no more. No more auction block for me, many thousand gone. So she's singing a song from the slavery days. An auction block, people would buy and sell people who were in slavery. And so that was a song that the, the black people would sing about how sad they were, that their friends or family had been auctioned off or sold. How surprised Ella's friends were. This wasn't the popular song they were supposed to sing. It was a song about the end of slavery, a song of freedom, and it was the first time they'd ever sung one of their own songs before an audience. The singers hesitated, but Ella's voice seemed to lift them up with hers, and as their voices joined hers, like streams flowing into a deep river, they could feel everyone in the hall leaning forward to listen. But they're singing a song about the end of slavery. When the song ended, there was only silence. Afterwards, some people said it had been like hearing a band of angels. Others found themselves in tears. All at once, the hall erupted with shouts and cheers and applause. Professor White was smiling and clapping too. Sing another one of the old songs, Ella. They want to hear more. Aunt Beth says that from that night on, Grandma Ellen and her friends always sang the powerful songs of sorrow and courage they'd learned from their parents and grandparents. They called them spirituals or jubilee songs because the word jubilee means a time of hope and freedom. And now that time had begun. The Jubilee singers became such a success they were invited to sing for thousands of people all over the United States and Europe. They even sang at the White House for President Grant and in England for Queen Victoria. Grandma Ella and the Jubilee singers traveled together for seven years, bringing back enough money to make their small school into Fisk University. There they are singing for the president. The president at that time was a man called President Grant. And look, here they are singing for Queen Victoria in a country called England. They had to travel across the ocean for that. Its most beautiful building is called Jubilee Hall. Inside, in a place of honor, hangs a painting of Grandma Ella and the singers. Whenever I see her proud face there, I feel like singing too. Today, there are still Jubilee singers who keep the old songs alive and share them with people all over the world. And that's true, Fisk University is a real place now. It's, a, it's still a university that you can go to when you go to college. As her story ends, Aunt Beth is quiet, thinking about the past. I put my hand in hers. When I grow up, I want to be a Jubilee singer, just like Grandma Ella. Aunt Beth smiles. Yes, but Grandma Ella would want you to do something else too. I know exactly what that is. Grandma Ella worked so hard singing that she never had the chance to finish her studies. None of those brave Jubilee singers graduated from the school they loved so much. But I will. So they didn't get a chance to keep studying and learning because they were so busy singing and saving their school. And she says, I'm going to go to Fisk University and graduate. Maybe he'll go there someday. Fisk University is one of what's called the historically black colleges and universities. 
because long ago people would not let black people into their colleges, a lot of people made their own. And so there's lots of historically black colleges. That means they were made for black people. And anybody can go there now, but they're very special places. There are places like Spelman and Morehouse and Howard and Xavier in, in New Orleans, and they're really different um, special places. So maybe when you get old enough to start thinking about college, you can go there. Now, I told you that I would um, show you. See, these are the pictures of the Jubilee Singers. There's nine of them. This is Ella Shepard. So she was born a slave in Nashville in 1851. This is Thomas Rutling. He also was born a slave in Tennessee. He began to work on a farm at age eight and his father was sold away before he was born. Can you imagine that? When people were enslaved, they did not get to stay with their families a lot of the time. This is Minnie Tate. She was born to free parents. Some black people were able to buy their freedom or to run away and be free. This is Isaac P. Dickerson. He was born a slave in Virginia. And this is Maggie Porter. She was one of the first people to go to Fisk. She started teaching when she was 15, but her schoolhouse was burned down by people who were against schools for black people. Some people still did not want black people to learn to read and write. And she later came back to Fisk and joined the Jubilee Singers. On this page, this is Benjamin Holmes. He was born into slavery in Charleston, South Carolina. When he was seven, he was apprenticed to a tailor. That means he started learning from another older tailor. He learned how to read by studying the signs on the streets as he made deliveries. So he taught himself. This is Jenny Jackson. She was born free in Tennessee. This is Green Evans. He was born into slavery in Tennessee, and during summer vacations in Fisk, he taught in a log schoolhouse that he helped to build himself. And this is Eliza Walker. She was born into slavery near Nashville. So these are real people. And did you know that the Jubilee Singers are still at Fisk? If you go there, you can see them and you can hear them perform, and they still sing those beautiful songs from long ago. I just love this story because I love music, I love hearing about all of the brave things they did, and I love these illustrations. I hope you liked it. I'll read to you later. Bye!